Good afternoon, everybody. We're ready to begin. Uh, my name is Graham Hamill. I'm Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School, and it is my um, true pleasure to welcome you to UB's seventh annual three-minute thesis competition. Um, this competition is a campus-wide competition that asks advanced doctoral students to present their research to a panel of non-specialists in three minutes or less. I also want to welcome our audience from campus and actually from all over the globe who are watching today um, over live stream. And at this point, I'd like to invite President Satish Tripathi to come to the stage and offer some introductory remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Graham, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for one of my favorite UB events. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most about the three-minute thesis competition uh, is learning about the impactful ideas and innovations that our PhD students are exploring. You know, having sat on a fair, my fair share of uh, dissertation committees, probably uh, more than 100. Uh, I am just as intrigued by the parameters of this competition, which makes a great fun to watch. Uh, you know, as academics, we can appreciate what a feat it must be to expound on the complex concept while the clock is ticking down. You know, we can all talk about what we're doing if we're given enough time. But not only you have limited time, but you have, ta you have to talk to people who are not from your field. So if, when you're talking to the dis dissertation committee, of course they all are expert and you can talk to them in your own language. But now you're talking to people who definitely are coming from all kinds of the judges are having experience in different fields and you have to convince them in three minutes that what you're doing makes sense and they can understand it. But you know, I know that uh, uh, you are extremely well prepared for the moment such as this. At UB, we have done, if we have done our job, our students have learned how to translate intricate theories into clear arguments. They have learned how to convert specialized research into practical solutions, and as a result, they are leveraging their talent to serve the greater good. In short, our UB students are ready and able to lead in the world. Today, we are comfortable and fortunate to get a glimpse of how they plan to do just that, and I want to wish you all the very best. I would be listening and learning so thank you and congratulations to the finalists. Thank you, President Tripathi. Um, I'm gonna say a few words about the three minute thesis competition. Um, the competition was founded at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008. And, the, and at this point, the competition is globally recognized and held in over 900 universities in over 85 countries. 3MT has two main goals. The first is to share, recognize, and celebrate the excellent research undertaken by doctoral students across the globe. And the second goal is to encourage graduate students to sharpen their ability to communicate their research concisely and effectively. To that end, preparation for the 3MT um, competition here at UB began in the fall with our preliminary round. This initial round brought fierce competition and a record number of participants, leading to the 10 finalists that we have here today. After being selected, our finalists went through various workshops and training to help them hone their abilities, including a digital portrait workshop. And if you look outside, um, either as you're coming in or as you're going out, these digital portraits, um, they're on the 3MT website and along the hallway out here. They give a beautiful representation of the finalists and the research presented here today. So thanks to Blackstone Launchpad, UB School of Management, and University of Communication for supporting all of the workshops that went into training and 
helping the, our graduate students. Today's event is co-hosted by the Graduate School and Blackstone Launchpad and sponsored by the Innovation Hub powered by UB's Business and Entrepreneurship Partnerships. Thanks to all the staff who worked hard to host this event and thank you to our campus partners for your work in promoting this event through our university-wide campaign. I especially want to commend all graduate students who have participated. There has been a remarkably positive response to this event from students and faculty who all recognize the importance of doctoral education to the research mission of our university. Um, just so you're aware, UB has a number of online doctoral programs and our students are completing dissertation work at sites worldwide. So for this reason, our competition format has expanded to be more inclusive and we have one, co one contestant this year who will pitch virtually. On the screen is a QR code that will take you to the 3MT website, and there you can find the bios of our MC, judges, and today's contestants. And now, to begin today's program, Rick Gardner, Associate Vice President for Economic Development of UB's Office of Business and Entrepreneurship Partnerships, or BEP, will say a few words. Thanks to BEP, prizes are doubled from last year. So, Rick. Hello. So I just wanted to say a few things and then we'll get started. But, um, you know, there's always going to be a need for university research and growing our knowledge and provide, you know, innovative new discoveries. Having said that, we're beginning to see a pivot in some of the um, agencies that fund university research. More and more, they're asking how these innovations are going to make it from the lab into society. And you know, they're really emphasizing this idea that innovation to imp having innovation impact the world requires that you, you get your innovation to the world. And so that's kind of ties into what we do in business and entrepreneur partnerships. Um, we really roll up our sleeves and help UB innovators get their innovations to market. Um, we might, you know, we might help an entrepreneur take, a, take an innovation, understand what the market potential for it is, and, and find ways to get that to market. So it could be anything from patenting your idea to licensing your idea to an existing company or even maybe even uh, forming a startup. So on the startup path, we have a broad range of services to help do this. Um, and these include things like free legal services from the Entrepreneur Law, Law Clinic at UB. That's a very valuable service when you're in the early days of a startup and don't have much money. And so that's a very valuable service that we can provide. We also have lab space and office space in one of our two incubators that's available to, um, to innovators. Um, we have a program called The Cultivator, which is a very, very early stage startup program that provides up to $100,000 in investment and, and a lot of coaching and mentoring to help that startup get to uh, the next phase of growth and development. In addition to that, if a, if a startup makes it and starts gaining some traction, we offer up to $250,000 in a seed investment. So all in all, UB is really poised to help the Western New York uh, region continue its trajectory uh, as a hub for innovation and really advance the next generation of great technologies through early stage startups. Um, and, you know, I hope that we see one of the great ideas from today um, come into the business and entrepreneur partnerships and we can help take that thing to the, to the world. So thank you and good luck, and I'm looking forward to this. So I know everybody's eager for the competition to start. Um, so at this point, I want to introduce our celebrity um, guest master of ceremonies, Jordan Walbesser, who is a double, a UB double alum from computer science, and he also got his JD from the law school. Um, he's also director of legal and business affairs at Mattel, Inc. Jordan will introduce the judges and the participants in today's competition. All right, so uh, it was about 10 seconds ago where I learned that I'm a celebrity. So, um, so thank you for that. Uh, I did not charge nearly enough money for this appearance. Uh, in, in fact, uh, no, honestly, it is, it is my pleasure to be here. And this is one of these things that I do uh, because I love giving back 
to the university. So uh, as, as, as Graham said, I am Jordan Walbesser. Uh, I have yeah, two degrees. I loved UB so much. I decided to come back here again, first time for computer engineering, the second time for law. Um, but, but the reason that I'm here today is probably because of what I do. So we're taking very complex, uh, very learned, very intricate things, and then we're explaining them in, in three minutes and in a very simple way that anyone should understand. So it makes sense that they would ask a toy lawyer who has to deal with kids, usually under the age of you know, five or six, uh, to be up here to be hosting this, because if you can explain it to someone uh, that is five or six year, years old and myself, you're probably doing great. Uh, I did want to, to take a second, one, to say thank you to all of the people uh, that were involved in organizing this event. You've done a fantastic job. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of our participants. So here we have something where not only are our participants researching, they're at the cutting edge of their field, spending late nights in the lab, at the library, out in the field, trying to uh, make a difference and an impact in this world. But on top of that, they've taken this extra step to be here today and to communicate their research with all of you. So thank you very much for your time, your energy, and uh, your perseverance for wanting to get up here and, and go do this. Uh, lastly, I wanted to say one more bit of thanks to everyone else, both here in the room and at home, watching wherever you are. Uh, it takes more than one person to get a doctorate. I know at the end of the day, only one person gets the hood, only one person gets the title, but it's the friends, it's the family, it's the loved ones that support uh, our students, that support our doctoral candidates, that support this research. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for supporting the university. And with that, let's get started, because you're not here to listen to me, despite the fact that I'm a celebrity. Um, but it is my pleasure to officially welcome all of you to UB's seventh annual three-minute thesis competition. The PhD students presenting their research today will be judged, okay, will be judged on their communication style in two ways. First, was the research communicated in language appropriate to a non-specialist audience? So again, me, a five-year-old, uh, our judges, uh, that's way one. And second was the slide, the, the one static slide allowed during each presentation, uh, clear and helpful to enhance that presentation. In addition, presentations will be judged on comprehension. Uh, did they make the audience understand the research? And finally, the presenters will be judged on how engaging they were. Did they leave you wanting to know more about this research? So we are honored today to have an esteemed panel of judges whose evaluations will determine our first, second, and third place prize winners and all of those great prizes that come with it. Our panel of judges is made up of community leaders from a range of industries, including real estate, higher education, government, STEM, and logistics. Our judges are experienced professionals who have mastered the skill of communicating their work to broad audiences and therefore recognize the development of this critical skill in graduate students and the potentially global impact of doctoral research. So without further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to our judges. First up, Mo Sabundu, Assistant Director, Empire State Development. Go ahead, raise your hand. Thank you, Mo. Next up, we have Kelsey Lewis, Assistant Professor, Department of Global Gender and Sexuality Studies. Kelsey, thank you. <laughs> Next, Ezra Rich, Marketing Communications Manager, Uniland Development Company. Ezra. <laughs> Next up, Simone Ragland, Executive Director of the Western New York STEM Hub. Simone, thank you. And last, but certainly not least, Aaron Johnson, Vice President of Organizational Strategy and Development at Ingredients Plus. Thank you very much, Aaron. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please remember uh, that everyone watching in person and over our live stream today is a judge. So we're all judges. Your votes will help determine the People's Choice Award winner. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And now, Finally, right? On to the competition. Our finalists today represent the absolute finest at UB. I will be introducing each finalist to you. 
And as I am doing so, they will come up on stage and prepare to present. I'll finish my introduction once we get everything all set up with the words, ready, set, pitch. And you may take a moment to center yourselves, that deep breath, and then when you start speaking your first word, uh, that's when the slide will appear on the screen and the three-minute timer will start. There's monitors for you on center stage, uh, displaying the timer to both the presenter and to the audience and the judges. Okay, so without further ado, our first presenter uh, starting us off is actually going to be presenting online. So uh, we'll make sure we get all the hiccups off before we get started. But first up is Moza Kut. Uh, and her, uh, excuse me, Moza's presentation is about mentoring that matters, improving the mentored experiences of black women teachers. Uh, Moza, can, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much for being here. Um, where are you talking to us from? I'm in New York City right now. Excellent. Did you get any of the snow yet? No. Please keep it in Buffalo. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you know this, Moza, but we had uh, quite a bit this year, and we are happy to share. I think uh, sharing is caring. So, um, you know, Moza has such an interesting background. Uh, you know, her, your hometown you'd consider to be Brooklyn, but you also hail from Zambia, and you've lived and worked in, in Mexico and in Trinidad as well. I'm noticing a pattern. These are all warmer places, so uh, definitely not like Buffalo. Um, all right, Moza, are you ready to begin? I am. Okay. Well, with that, ready, set, pitch. Have you ever felt discouraged and defeated? Well, that's exactly how I felt at the end of my first week as a new teacher. On my first day, I walked in excited and ready, or so I thought. But at the end of that week, I was discouraged, defeated, ready to call it quits. But a mentor made all the difference for me. The support she provided turned my discouragement into possibility and my defeat into victory. Sadly, not every new teacher has a positive mentoring experience like mine. For many new teachers, mentoring is the main and often the only support they receive as novice educators to promote retention in the profession. So it's critical we get mentoring right. New black women teachers are the most likely to report that the mentoring they received was ineffective. My research focuses on listening to and learning from the experiences of new black women teachers to understand where our current mentoring systems have failed them and in what ways we can strengthen mentoring to make it more impactful. Black teacher turnover is 60% greater than that of other teachers. In cities across the country, the decline in the number of black teachers is particularly disturbing. For example, in a 10 year period in New York City, the number of black teachers decreased by 15%, 39% in Chicago and 62% in New Orleans. What I'm learning from listening to the stories of black women is that they need the kind of mentoring that not only supports their instructional practice, but that helps them navigate the socio-emotional realities of being a teacher and helps them feel a sense of belonging at their school community. If we say we care about equity and justice and retaining a diverse teacher workforce, we cannot sit by and let an entire population of teachers just fritter away. I know the picture I've just painted of the current reality sounds really discouraging and defeating, but by implementing the kind of mentoring that truly matters, we give new black women teachers access to the victorious outcome both they and their students deserve. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Moza. That was excellent. Okay. Um, I'll try to keep things moving along. We have a lot of great theses to listen to. Uh, so next up on our list here, presenter number two is Min Ma. Min Ma will be presenting on mapping 
of all the proteins at once, a novel technique. So um, let's see, Min comes from uh, the Academic Department of Molecular and Cellular Biophysics and Biochemistry. So uh, in, you know, after you're, you're doing that during the day, you also like, I guess, to paint and, and read books and um, learning new sports. Is that right? What's, uh, what's one of the sports that, that, you know, I'm putting you on the spot. I apologize. But what's one of the new sports that you've learned about uh, since you've been at UB? Roller skating during this time. Roller skating. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, there's plenty of great spots around campus to be roller skating, yeah. and especially uh, maybe not in the winter. Uh, it's a little no. bit difficult getting over the Definitely snow banks, not. but yeah. but in the summer, it's absolutely perfect for that. Well, Min, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Well, ready, set, pitch. When you take a pill for your headache, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it causes side effects and damage to liver or stomach. Why? Does the drug go to the right place? When solving a problem like this, spatial information or the location of drug and disease is important. For example, to play baseball, you meet your friends at the baseball field. You and them being in the same location is a prerequisite for the activity to happen. Similarly, the drug and the disease need to be at the same location for the cure. And to get to the diseased spot, the drug needs to travel a long way and it better grab a map, a map of all the proteins in your body. It's just like when you are driving to a city you've never been to. Can you get there without your Google or Apple map? And no, I can't because I even needed a map to find our library. Without spatial information, the location of drug and proteins in your body, it is impossible to study diseases and treatments. Surprisingly, people have not studied these important questions with the aspect of spatial information. Why? Because a technique that can map the locations of all the proteins is lacking. Here, my teammates and I have developed a revolutionary method that can make a map for every protein in the organ with detailed regional information. For the first time, we have reviewed the location maps of thousands of proteins in the whole mouse brain. With these maps, we can locate the important activities of proteins, and when the drug enters the body, we can locate the area where it receives enough drug and where is still waiting for its rescuers. Think about how wonderful this is. For all the time in the past, drugs strive to find their way in the dark, but they could not hit the disease and could not avoid harming your healthy body parts. Now, with my research, we can design better drugs and navigate them to the right place and really treat the disease. With Google Maps, we can get everywhere we want. And with our protein maps, we can design better drugs, treat diseases, and save people. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Min. That was excellent. Uh, I, I think this goes to show that hopefully all of you see, as we continue on today, that um, you know, one of the best things that UB creates is well-rounded students. Okay, it's, it's not just our, our studies that set our alumni apart, it's also, uh, you know, what else they do outside of the research, and, uh, and that was just a, an excellent presentation. So, next up, we have uh, Muhammad Arafat Ali. Uh, now, Muhammad is going to be presenting on the fight against the forever chemical, uh, and Muhammad is part of the School of Engineering and Applied sciences, uh, applied sciences, and your hometown is in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Did I, did I say that right, Dhaka? Yes. Very good. Um, now, you happen to be not only a big cricket fan, which, which I'm a fan of too, uh, but you like watching movies and TV series. So you, you had your late day at the lab, you, know, you, you put the computer away. What's, uh, what's that favorite TV series that you're watching right now? Big Bang Theory, okay, that's something that all engineers seem to uh, yeah, uh, identify with some, for some reason, I'm not really sure. 
Well, um, we're very glad to have you here, and we're really excited to hear about your research. So are you ready to begin? Yeah. OK. Well, in that case, ready, set, pitch. What if I tell you everyone, literally everyone in this room, and the people who are watching virtually contains a toxic, cancer-causing chemical in body? Scary, right? But that's the truth. That chemical is known as PFAS. The full form is per and polyfluoroalkyl substance. It is a synthetic chemical that has a unique property to repel both oil and water. And for this reason, starting from non-stick pan to personal care product, everything that we use in our life, most of those things has PFAS in it. For example, I see many of you have brought coffee with you. Those one-time coffee cups are made of PFAS. How many of you had sandwich for lunch today? Probably 10, 15 people in this whole room. Those sandwich wrapper probably had PFAS in it. And for this reason, PFAS has entered into our food system. It has been found in drinking water, even in breast milk. Do we really want to let it go like this? The answer is no. So we have to find out a treatment technology that completely removes PFAS from water. Here comes my research. My research focuses on this. But here is a fact. PFAS as a chemical is a very strong and hard to break. That is why it is called forever chemical. Adsorption seems to be a solution for this, which is removing the PFAS from water using a solid filter material. But you see, this is kind of extracting the PFAS, not destroying it. The PFAS is remaining same as it is. It is kind of like taking trash from one basket to another. Here comes our innovation. In our lab, we develop different material. Recently, we have developed a nano-sized material that has shown very promising results in terms of PFAS removal. Within 20 minutes of treatment time, we have seen more than 95% PFAS can be removed from water. And most importantly, we have seen the partial degradation of PFAS. Yes, we have been achieved to break it down. And with some modification, I believe, and we all believe, that we will be able to completely break down this PFAS into smaller and smaller fragments that won't be harmful for human health anymore. PFAS is a forever chemical, but we want to say, let's defeat these forever chemicals for once and for all. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you for, uh, for both scaring me and making me feel better within a three minute period. That is, that is absolutely fantastic and, and really great work. Um, you know, I, I think what's so great about research is, you know, especially when it's applied like this, uh, is, is that our best and brightest here at the university are figuring out solutions to problems that we are facing both now and in the future. So uh, really excited to hear about that kind of work. Uh, thank you again. Uh, next up, we have uh, Faye Hachasani. Faye Hachasani, who is going to come up and tell us uh, a bit about dialogue between Iranian philosophy and recent continental philosophy, secret. And, uh, and you are part of the uh, comparative literature department. Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, everyone had a couple fun facts about this. And again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, um, but you don't share any of your food. That's, uh, that's what you've written down. And I understand, although now with PFAS, I don't know, actually. Um, I'm not sure I'm eating anymore. Uh, you know, my, my dissertation will be on diet studies using PFAS. But, but no, um, you, do, you, do you have a favorite type of food or a favorite dish that, that you like to eat or maybe even you like to make? Of course, Iranian food. Iranian food, of yeah. course, of course, of course. Well, we're very excited to hear uh, you. your thesis. So are you ready to begin? Yeah. OK, well then, ready, set. Pitch. Do you think you know the secret of Jennifer Lopez's romantic success? Or of Olivia Wilde's routine beauty? You might think you know, because the media makes such secrets daily available to billions of us. And we, in turn, are supposed to feel special for having access to our favorite celebrities. But do we really have access to their secrets? So what would it mean not to reveal the secret and keep it secretive? This is what my project is about to pursue a comparative analysis on the secret in Iranian medieval philosophy and Western philosophy. 
This is important for two main reasons. First, it shows these two systems of thoughts are not necessarily incompatible with each other, as we often believe. Secondly, it indicates there was a time in Iranian history when philosophers prized the plurality of meaning, ambiguity, and tolerance. If we think of the secret as a meaning that evolves rather than a fixed truth, then we become more tolerant for other people's ideas. But unfortunately, these contributions of those Iranian uh, philosophers have been forgotten over the years because of many reasons, but chiefly due to political constraints. It is not surprising that these philosophers were not accepted even during their own times. Many have been sent to exile, punished, or even executed because their contemporary political and religious authority rejected their idea of the dynamic secrets of the text and specifically of the religious text. In the West also many philosophers have speculated on this concept. I focus on Jacques Derrida, who considers literature as being similar to the secret and secret as being literature. This does not mean that literature doesn't offer any meaning, but its meaning is not fully there yet. The literary work always keeps secret to tell us in future. And this is my point. The secret will never be revealed completely in the present. But why does it matter? Why should we keep everyone in perpetual suspense? Because the idea of an unrevealed secret can show us, can, uh, can help us create a more democratic, pluralistic, and tolerant world. The Iranian sage Sohrevardi once told us, read the scripture in a way that it's a secret written only for you. I believe if leadership in Iran today chose to reflect on this statement, they would be led to think about the prospects of democracy. So let's think about the secret again, but not only the secret of Jennifer Lopez, but the secret as a dynamic concept central for democracy. Thank you. Hey, excellent, thank you so much, Faye, that was excellent. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's great to see, and, and one of the strengths of this university is that there are so many different aspects of research that are being completed, both from, you know, the scientific, but also in the humanities, and, and there's good balance between those. And if you don't have that balance, you miss out on something. So that was a really, really, really fascinating uh, three minutes that you gave me, and I, I can't wait to, uh, to think about that some more. And maybe there's some secrets in what I'm saying, too. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Okay, next up is Muganka Paraznas. Muganka Paraznas, uh, who's coming from the uh, Materials Design and Innovation Department, and uh, your hometown is in uh, India, and, uh, and, and you've lived both in, in now, let, let me make sure I get this right, Pune? Pune, yeah. Pune, Pune, okay, Pune, and then uh, and in Mumbai as well. So, um, how has the difference been between Mumbai, where it's very warm, I've, I've been there, and, and here? Was it a bit of a shock when you came? Yes, that's correct. It was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your first coat that you had to buy, yeah, that must have been, uh, yes. but must have been great. But obviously, you've, you have, um, you've, you've stuck through, and you've managed to survive the winters, and, and we're very grateful for that, and we're very grateful for what you do at UB. So um, are you ready to begin? Yes. OK, well then, ready, set. Pitch. You may be surprised to know that nearly half a million children under the age of six have been affected by the release of lead from corroded pipes and paints across two million homes in US. An insignificant amount of only 10 milligram of lead can cause brain damage and eventually lead to death. What's more surprising is that each and every year for the past two decades, nearly $16 billion have been spent on releasing this red from water and soil sources. Well, that's a lot of money, but still this problem is persistent. To solve this problem, we need to develop more effective, economical, and environment-friendly new materials. My research focuses on one such material, which is called as mycelium, the root part of fungus. Now let's talk about the fungus. We all know about the fungus that we have in our cuisine. It is the oldest and the youngest, the largest and the smallest, the healer of many years, 
silently cleaning the earth since the origins of life. Believe it or not, but there is a huge world of this fungus which is found right beneath the soil, like a network, just like you have in your brain or the computer network. And it forms a wood wide web. It is called as mycelium. This mycelium contains many proteins and enzymes which are responsible for pollutant removal. Even if this mycelium is an excellent filter, it is not practical to use it in our water filters or to grow it in the buffalo soil. Hence, I prepare a biomaterial out of this live mycelium, which is more resilient and an alternative to plastic filters. My study also explores on increasing how much amount of lead is getting adsorbed through advanced materials along with this mycelium, and we create a novel membrane. My study has already shown 99% lead removal, and we do it in just 30 minutes. I would like to be a part of this community to solve this pressing environmental problem, to make the soil and water safer to you, your children, and generations to come. I hope my research will benefit the disadvantaged communities and the environment at large. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Bruganka. That's excellent. Um, you know, if there's one strand that connects everything, just like mycelium, right, between all of these, uh, these theses that we're hearing about, it is the potential and the goal of having an impact on the world around us. And I think that is a wonderful thing uh, for each of us to be focusing on and, and, and for each of us to be working towards. So, okay, next up we have Josie Diebold. Uh, Josie comes from the School of Social Work and will be presenting on Investigating Shared Interest, White People's Stake in the Fight for Racial Justice. So um, there's a lot of things that you do outside of the, the classroom as well. And, um, and, and like myself, I have a cat. You have a cat. I do. Um, so that's excellent. And, and your, your cat's name is? Peanut. Peanut. That's, yeah. That, that's a perfect cat name. Thank you. Um, if, if you like cats and you're here today, check the center stairs. There's some great artwork that someone put up with a whole bunch of cats on the stairwell. It's absolutely fantastic. But, but you're also, uh, you also keep pretty busy at, at CrossFit. Is I do. Is that right? Yes. So that, that is excellent. Um, it's always good to be doing something in the winter when it's uh, a little tough to be outside. But uh, are you ready to begin? I am. Okay. Well, in that case, ready, set, pitch. Picture this. In 1676, a multiracial group of poor and working class people came together and they literally set Jamestown, Virginia on fire. So at the time, this group of people white indentured servants and enslaved black folks actually often worked together and they were treated very similarly, which is to say inhumanely. And so they came together to challenge those conditions. Now, why do I share that? Well, the plantation elite, they saw this and they knew that that multiracial group of people had the power to upend the system that kept the wealthy wealthy and they had to respond. So what did they do? They used racism to drive a wedge between people of shared class interests. They used racism to divide and conquer. But there's an antidote to this divisiveness of racism. It's one that's really important to me as a white anti-racist community organizer in 2023, and that is mutual interest. In other words, when I say mutual interest, I mean that for those of us who are white, we need to understand what the costs of racism have been for us and what we have to gain by being part of the struggle for racial justice. So for my research, I'm interviewing white anti-racist organizers about their shared stake in the struggle for racial justice. And what I'm hearing is more about those costs about the disconnection to others, the lost sense of humanity, and the barriers to meeting their basic needs, but I'm also hearing what people see is possible and what can be gained when we come together in the struggle. It's a world, a vision of a transformed society where everybody has everything that we need and deserve. And this is important for me as a white anti-racist organizer because it informs our strategy 
for how we overcome that divide and conquer of racism and bring more white people into the movement, not just for a little while, but for the long haul. So maybe we are or we aren't going to set a town on fire, but like that multiracial coalition in 1676, our goal is to demand radical change. And when those of us who are white understand what our shared stake is in the fight for racial justice, then we can commit to the long haul on that road to liberation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Josie. Judges, how are we doing down here? We good? I am um, I'm very glad that I'm not you. All of these presentations have been excellent, and this is going to be a, a tough one to decide. But as a reminder for all of you in this room and for you online, again, you are all judges too. So pay attention, take some notes, because you uh, at the end will be able to pull in your own vote for the People's Choice Award. So uh, without further ado, uh, next up is Leo Marecki. Leo Marecki, uh, who comes from the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, your hometown is right here in Buffalo, is that right? Yes, yes it is. And um, I, I have it down here that uh, you have a couple hobbies. Some of them are pretty interesting to me. One of them mm -hmm. is musical instruments. Okay, uh, do you yeah. have a favorite? Um, so I would say my primary one is the, the cello, just because it has very wide range and can you know, do a lot of emotion but I've played all the standard orchestra string instruments as well. So each of them have you know, different aspects that you know, bring different qualities to the music. Okay, so if, um, I'm gonna put you on the spot. If the School of Engineering was an <laughs> instrument, what <laughs> instrument would that be? And, and, and be careful. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would equate it to violin. There's, there's aspects where it's very low, very rich, you know, very cultured. And then there's tiny little moments where you got that high-pitched moment and you're like, oh, I don't know if I like that yeah. that much. When I was in engineering, it was a lot of squeaking, trust me. Yeah. Um, but we made it through. Twinkle, twinkle, little star was, was you know, my thesis getting out of undergrad. All right, are, are you ready? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, ready, set, pitch. So magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a very useful uh, imaging tool. The reason for this is the fact that it can identify many, many different tissues. However, MRI lacks the ability of telling you what's going on in those tissues. So that's where positron emission tomography, or PET scanning, comes into play. However, PET scanning doesn't have the ability to identify tissues. So because of that, my research focuses on add PET to any MRI. So my research focuses specifically on preclinical or animal studies, not necessarily like the dogs you see up here, but, uh, but more or less mice, which you hear about all the time being you know, used in different preclinical studies and everything. So the reason for, so my research focuses on being able to take different PET scanners of different dimensions and different sizes and being able to retrofit them with other MRI systems. The advantage to this is the fact that by being able to retrofit any PET scanner, when researchers are developing different technology for the PET scanners, it can be integrated directly with the MRI without needing some commercial system that needs to be utilized. Now, the reason for this focus is the fact that animal uh, scanners in particular have one of the highest resolutions and are some of the best reconstructions. So because of that, my focus is, is focusing on those animals' uh, PET scanners. Now, the reason why animal studies are very, very important is the fact that when you're trying to develop a new type of drug or therapy method, there's this concept known as effective dose. So essentially, like when you're taking something like, uh, like Tylenol, you know, there's that instruction of take it X many hours and everything. The reason for that is because there's a value known as the effective dose. And as we all know with many other different drugs that we hear about, there's also things like overdose. So my research focuses also on being able to quantify the pet, uh, the pet images, so that way you can determine what is the effective dose and what is an overdose. Now, it, when it comes to this type of research, this has, a, this has a very big application when you're trying to develop new things like vaccines. So, you know, we all went through COVID and everything. 
So because of that, my research focuses on improving specifically the animal studies because animal studies, as we know, is the stepping stone to human studies. And so by, so by improving the, res the quality that we can get of animal studies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, as well as other researchers like here at UB, will be able to get uh, will be able to improve the scans that they are able to acquire, get more quantifiable information, and will be able to bring new drugs and therapy methods to the public so that way things like COVID won't ever happen again. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Leo. Um, let's see. I, I liked how everything in that one was three letter words add, pet, any MRI. That is, is perfect for me. Um, no, very good, very good. Uh, next up we have Haley Chizik. Haley Chizik, who is coming from the School of Public Health and Health Professions and will be presenting on using bench work to get off the bench, assessing saliva during concussion recovery. So um, I have it here that you played tennis and you were a pole vaulter when you were in, in school. That's um, true. Did you get any concussions when you were a pole vaulter? See, I never had a diagnosed concussion, but I'm pretty sure it happened. So I, yes. I think <laughs> I, I think to uh, you know to have that shutzpah to actually say I'm going to go take the stick and fly through the air is probably uh, maybe not as difficult as a PhD, but still very <laughs> very very impressive. Um, okay, uh, are are you ready to present? Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, ready, set, pitch. What can your spit tell you about your health? For the millions of people who receive concussions, there may be more to learn from spit than once expected. Concussions are traumatic brain injuries which often occur in sports. Symptoms include headache, nausea, and dizziness. This can affect a range of everyday activities from going to school, going to work, or driving a car. If an athlete receives a concussion, they are removed from sport. And if they go back to sport too soon, they're at risk for prolonged recovery and worsening symptoms. This can mean additional weeks, months, or years of unnecessary suffering. Athletes must be 100% recovered before they return to sport. Unfortunately, that's not always what happens. I'm sure many of you here saw the recent Miami Dolphins versus Buffalo Bills game where Miami's quarterback, Tua, received a concussion. Not only did he continue to play during that game, but the mismanagement of his concussion led him to receiving a secondary injury that ended his season. And errors like that are unacceptable when it comes to the brain health of professional athletes, recreational athletes, collegiate athletes, the millions of kids worldwide, and the thousands of kids in Buffalo who play sports. Their brain health matters. But what if there was another way to assess concussion recovery? That's where saliva comes in. Our lab currently takes saliva samples from concussed athletes, and using bench work, which are laboratory experiments, we assess that saliva. Previous research indicates that the components of saliva may provide valuable insights into the concussion recovery process. Therefore, this simple test might help increase clinician and athlete confidence that they're returning to sport at the right time. Concussions are serious injuries, and athletes are serious about their sports. So we need to be just as serious about protecting our brains. You only have one brain, so why not use all of the available tools to make sure it stays safe? And one of those tools might already be on the tip of your tongue. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Haley. Look, any test, uh, medical test that does not involve drawing my blood, I am 100% for. So uh, I, I hope I don't end up in that situation, but that sounds like a, a great thing that you've been working on. Uh, next up, we have uh, Clayton Brady. Clayton Brady comes uh, from the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, and will be presenting, and I love this title, okay, all about that base. The f <laughs> physiolo physiology, excuse me, uh, with the pH underlined. Okay, very clever. We get it. Uh, of acid-base 
balance. So, okay, you get my reward for the, the punniest title. Um, you're a golfer, okay? And, and mm. actually, you're quite an athlete. Um, you had something pretty interesting happen to you out on the links. Can you tell us about it? Uh, I think you're referring to the hole-in-one that I hit. That's mm. right. Now, on, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I mean, we're impressed. The judges are impressed. However, it's not going to be part of the grading rubric, this, this hole-in-one. Now, okay, Clayton, were you alone? I was not. Oh, okay. Not. So other people saw. Yeah, it. yeah, I know. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm forever chasing that high. Well, well, that yeah, that's that's good. We are we are very proud of you for doing that, not only but also for uh, for your studies here. So, uh, are you ready to present? Uh, I think so. Okay. In that case, ready, set, pitch. We all strive for balance in our lives, but I'll bet one form of balance you haven't thought about is the acid base or pH balance that's happening inside your body. And fortunately, you don't have to think about it. Our body has complex mechanisms that work together to keep pH in balance. If pH balance is like maintaining a comfortable temperature in your house, then the pH that I am studying is how our body keeps that pH in balance. I'm guessing most of us set our thermostat somewhere around 70 degrees. And by doing so, no matter what temperature changes happen on the outside, the inside stays almost constant at that 70 degree set point. The same principle applies to our blood pH. Despite variations in how much we eat, drink, or exercise, all of which can affect pH, it stays exquisitely close to its set point of 7.4. So with this analogy to temperature in mind, what I have been searching for is the thermostat for pH. Now, during an acidosis, which is defined as anything that decreases pH, our brain senses this change and triggers an increase in breathing in order to blow off the extra acid in the form of carbon dioxide. At the same time, our kidney responds by increasing acid excretion in our urine. So if a decrease in pH is like a decrease in temperature, then these responses by our brain with its control of breathing and our kidney with control of acid excretion are just like your furnace and fireplace working together to keep your house warm. But how do these organs sense that there was a decrease in pH in the first place? Well, we discovered that in the brain, a single molecule called NBCE1 acts just like a thermostat for pH. At the molecular level, NBC1 transports base across the membranes of our cells. And because this transport increases during acidosis, this acts as a signal to our brain that our pH is decreasing. To understand the impact of this, we genetically modified mice so that they are missing NBCE1. And we tested their response to acidosis. And we found that the expected increase in breathing never happened. Just imagine your furnace with a broken thermostat, unable to respond to a fallen temperature. Even more surprising, because these mice don't blow off carbon dioxide like they're supposed to, this caused the kidney to overreact and excrete more acid than it was supposed to given the severity of acidosis, a response that can actually cause damage to the kidney. To take our temperature analogy to the extreme, this would be like starting a bonfire in your living room just because your furnace broke. Since acidosis and kidney disease are often intertwined, it's my hope that these results will lead to better and more targeted therapies for kidney disease patients in the future. Overall, this research indi indicates that NBCE1 with its base transporting activity is an essential mechanism of pH sensing, which makes pH balance really all about that base. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clayton. Uh, un unfortunately, when I was off stage, I was informed that I would not be allowed to sing for legal reasons all about that base for you for the next three minutes, so um, I'm sorry. My deepest apologies to all of you. Uh, next up, we have Sandeepa uh, Bhuttacharji that will be talking about approaching a new era, impacts of India's Right to Education Act on women's family planning decisions. And you are from the College of Arts and Sciences. So um, speaking of people who can sing, who are not me, uh, apparently you can. This is something that, that you enjoy doing. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Oh yes, I have been trained in Indian classical music for not for a long period of time, but yes. And here at UB, apart from doing my PhD in the Department of Economics, I do participate in the UB choir and chorus. So we have semester concerts, so you are open to come and attend this semester's concert, which is on May 5th. I would love to see you all there. That's perfect, May 5th, okay. And, uh, and are you bringing your, your guitar, ukulele, anything like that? Or? No. Not this time, okay, okay. So multifaceted performer here, uh, you know, not just a PhD, but 
uh, music on the side. So are you ready to present? Yes. Okay, ready, set, pitch. Did you know that more than 12 million adolescent girls between ages 15 and 19 gave birth in 2019? Well, adolescent pregnancy is a global problem and is a leading cause of death for women worldwide. So teenage mothers, they are less likely to drop out from schools and this prevents them to participate in the workforce or contribute to household earnings, thereby creating intergenerational cycles of poverty. Take example of developing country like India. Here the problems of early child marriages, adolescent pregnancies is very prominent in the society, specifically in the rural areas. At least 20% of the young women who got pregnant as teenagers, they had no schooling. Consequentially, reducing teenage childbearing and promoting quality education for young women is a key factor in achieving United Nations Millennium Development Goals for reducing poverty, improving maternal health, and empowering women. So of all the factors that contribute to teenage pregnancies, lack of educational opportunities is one of the significant factor. Education is a critical tool to address environment, sustainability, societal issues created due to overpopulation. And here, my desire to educate women as an alternative to teenage pregnancies and parenthood is what motivates my research. As a microeconomist, I study this macro problem in evaluating a landmark 2010 education policy in India called the Right to Education Act. Now this act required students to complete free and compulsory eight years of education. Using a nationally representative sample survey data of more than 15 lakhs women and employing a statistical model, I find that this policy resulted in significant improvements in women's familial roles, thereby substantially delaying their age at first marriages, sexual activity, first birth, and reducing the overall birth rates. Well, I also look into other potential mechanisms. That is the knowledge effect and the autonomy effect. This means that with increased in education due to this policy, women have more information about contraceptions, family planning, healthcare. They pair themselves with men who has similar child preferences and they contribute to household decisions and feel more empowered. So what I find that this policy was very effective policy tool employed by the government of India in promoting education and if expanded further, it can result in further women empowerment. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sandeepa. So, uh, to all of our participants, breathe with me. Deep breath in, <laughs> deep breath out. <sighs> Congratulations, you've done it. I know three minutes flies by, but to all the friends, family, uh, staff, our, our folks online that are watching, it's not just three minutes of work that went into each one of these presentations. It was hours and hours and hours of preparation. So I'd like if we could all give all of our participants a round of applause for the effort that they put into this. So I hope you enjoyed these presentations as much as I did. I learned so much. These performances were absolutely excellent. And at this time, I invite our judges to stand up and step out of the room to deliberate about the presentations. So, um, and, and thank you, by the way. Again, a round of applause for our judges for, for their work. This will not be easy for them. Um, and, and again, uh, I was reminded that I can't sing and dance the entire time. To, uh, to entertain you while they are deliberating, but I assure you we have something uh, much better prepared for you. So uh, remember, again, today everyone in the audience, both here and online, is a judge. So it is now time for you to vote for the finalists that you feel did the best job communicating their research today. So um, please get out your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop computer, uh, I don't know, whatever you have, your graphing calculator that can go scan this QR code 
uh, pull up a website and get ready to vote. Now, please note, there are some rules here. It's only one vote per person, so, you know, no funny business. Um, the website address and a QR code directing you to the voting is shown on the screen now. If you can't get this thing to work, uh, you get to type in this bit.ly, UB3MT2023. Um, voting is now open. Please enter your votes now. And in order to keep in the theme of the three-minute thesis, we are going to give you, the audience, three minutes to vote. So I will ask our official time clock keeper to begin the timer. And dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, while you're doing that, and, and please take your time and please be thoughtful about your votes, uh, I just wanted to take a second again to say thank you to all of the people that have been involved with putting together the three-minute thesis year in and year out. Uh, like we said, this is not the first year that we've done this. This is the, let me make sure I get this right, the seventh annual three-minute thesis, which means that we've done this before COVID, during COVID, and now finally after COVID. So I am um, very grateful for all of them. And if you have a free hand or a free second, I'd love to give a quick round of applause to all of the people that have uh, put this together every year. Um, this is really a fantastic uh, opportunity to show off what our students here at the university are doing. Uh, I say are because uh, I'm still involved as an alumni, and even though uh, I spent my seven years on campus, they couldn't kick me out, uh, I am really happy to give back and really happy to be a part of this community even after I've been gone. So for all of you that are UB grads, uh, for those of you that will be UB grads, I implore you keep connected to this school. Uh, not only can this school make an impact and will make an impact on our local communities, our country, and also the world, uh, but us as alumni in the community can make an impact on those students while they're here. So, um, you know, thank you for coming out. You've already made that impact, uh, but please keep connected while you, uh, uh, in the future, while you do so. So, uh, I believe we have some entertainment queued up uh, while we are waiting for deliberation. Uh, understand that this may be a few minutes while our judges get this all uh, together and worked out. If you need to use the restroom, uh, take a break, stretch your legs, please go ahead and do so, and we will reconvene once the judges file back in. So, thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, I present to you some entertainment. All right, all right, all right, everyone. So, um, as you may have noticed, our judges are slowly returning to their seats. Um, the door was locked in the judges' room. I tried to get in. I was trying to peek and see who was going to be first, second, third, the, uh, um, you know, the audience's favorite prize. So I don't know. It's going to be as much of a surprise to me as it is for all of you. So um, again, before we get started, we've got all our judges here. Um, just a quick round of applause for all of our participants. To our participants, thank you so much for representing the university. Thank you for all that you have done. Uh, and thank you for what you are going to do. You all have very bright futures ahead of you. So, okay. I could, uh, you know, buy some more time, but I'm, I'm not going to let the suspense build up. At this time, I'd like to welcome Graham Hamill, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and the Dean of the Graduate School, back to the stage to begin the awards presentation. Thank you. And um, thanks again to Jordan, our um, celebrity MC, for, for emceeing this event. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. There's no script for me, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, so I'm going to announce the winners of the, this year's three-minute thesis competition. Um, everybody did a terrific job, and it was so much fun to watch, um, watch the presentations and to learn about all of the amazing um, work that's happening at UB. So thank you all for, um, for dedicating your time. 
The, um, I'll go from three to one, and then I'll announce people's choice um, last. Also, um, there's no script, so I apologize for this, but thank you to the judges also for, um, for participating and, um, and offering your guidance and wisdom. So, and what will happen is, I'm looking to Elizabeth to make sure this is what's gonna happen. Please come on stage when your name is announced. You will receive a giant check. <laughs> with the award, and then after the, um, after the award ceremony, if you could come back up for photos. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, ready? Um, third place, investigating shared interest, white people's stake in fight for racial justice, Josie Diebold. And good luck cashing the check. <laughs> <laughs> um, in second place, approaching a new era, impacts of India's Right to Education Act and women's family planning decisions. <laughs> Sandeepta Bhattacharaji. And now, um, first place, using bench work to get off the bench, assessing saliva during concussion recovery, Halia Chisholm. And finally, the People's Choice Award, and again, approaching a new era, impact of India's Right to Education Act and Women's Family Planning, Samdeepta Bhattacharjee. Sorry, <laughs> So thanks to everybody for attending this event and thanks to everybody who's watching live stream. Um, if the award winners could please come up afterwards for photos and everyone else, I, I invite you to join us for snacks and, um, and the like outside in the lobby. So thank you very much. <laughs>